Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle Finance Solutions Expo. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would love to turn the floor over to our wonderful partner, Bill, for our Marketplace Thought Leadership and Demo. Welcome and over to you. Very excited to discuss revamping your AP process and once again, this webinar is sponsored by Bill. What we're gonna do is talk about some of the challenges that many organizations face with regard to accounts payable. And then we will see a demo by my colleague, Seth. Uh, let's get started. So I think the first thing we wanna talk about, and I think this is uh, very important, obviously, is introducing both of us. Um, and once again, my colleague, Seth, who will provide a demo. Uh, he is a solutions consultant with Bill and you will benefit from his expertise very shortly. Um, now let's talk about financial operations. So we know from our experience, financial operations can get messy. And I think you can see where much of the source of the mess is. Number one, paper. Number two, manual processes. So that is the context. Uh, in which we talk about financial operations in general, we're gonna focus on accounts payable in particular. Now, what is frustrating about financial operations when we rely on paper, when we rely exclusively on paper, and when we rely on manual processes? Well, first of all, we don't have sufficient visibility. Even if we're using, say, spreadsheets, uh, these are spreadsheets that individuals have access to, but there's not sufficient visibility. Therefore, there's not sufficient control. We don't have visibility into timing. We don't have visibility necessarily into an approval process. Uh, we don't necessarily know the status of an approval process. And as a result, there's a, there's a risk, not only of lack of control, but also financial risk, lack of compliance, um, that can translate to uh, issues as well as risks of late payments. So these are a number of challenges that are typical of organizations that rely exclusively on paper, that rely on individual spreadsheets, that rely on manual processes. Now, what we'd like to do is posed the first of our four polling questions. Jason, I'll turn it over to you to display the polling question, and we will give attendees sufficient time to respond to the first of four polling questions. What we will wanna find out is the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement as it applies to your organization, whether or not your company relies on manual processes and the emphasis on relies on manual processes to keep track of invoices from top to bottom the choices are strongly agree agree disagree strongly disagree or i don't know what you're welcome to do is select one of these choices we'll leave this question up for enough time for you to respond again this is the first of four polling questions what we will do is continue our discussion before we ultimately transition to a demo from my colleague, Seth. Again, I think maybe just a few more seconds. And what we want to consider now is what makes accounts payable processes inefficient. I think the first thing is the dependence on paper means that there is not, among other issues, there's not a timely response to uh, invoices, um, that's one thing. Also, if you are relying on manual processes, that means that you are entering information, not necessarily into one system, but potentially into multiple systems. If, for example, your organization 
has an accounting system, an enterprise resource planning system, also known as an ERP system, or is entering data, let's say, in connection with your bank. So that is one consideration that there is a tremendous risk of errors. There's a tremendous risk uh, of fraud as well, because you don't have sufficient visibility and control. And with manual processes, whether we're talking about manual data entry or paper invoices, we and, and we're going to get to approvals in just a moment because that's another consideration, approvals. First of all, if you don't have a process in place, that is a problem. If you have to walk over to people or if you're working remotely and you need to get in touch with people individually, if you don't have a way to audit your process, that is a whole uh, risk in itself. And if you need to, uh, let's say, send um, documentation inter office, uh, you know, again, that leads to delays, but also lack of visibility and control. And manual routing, um, lack of visibility into the status of an approval process and who is responsible, lots of issues. And let me tell you something that type of process in particular, like data capture, that process lends itself to automation. We'll talk about that when we hear from SEP very soon. Another risk, payment. Um, you don't necessarily know, let's say you're relying on paper checks uh, and you mail a paper check. Uh, you don't know what's gonna happen with that check. What if it gets lost? What if somebody steals it? You don't know. Um, that, that is a risk. Also, you're exposing your banking information if you're relying on a paper check that you issue. And also, there's the waste that can result from relying on paper check stock. Um, and so there's just a lot of risk embedded even within a particular payment process. Now, I will point out, Bill does allow one to pay using paper checks, but we changed the process so we're not exposing your information. Um, another thing I want to acknowledge is reconciliation. I've mentioned earlier that many organizations, perhaps yours, uh, in, are using uh, accounting systems or using enterprise planning systems, for example. That means not only are you entering information about invoices uh, once, you're going to enter it potentially multiple times, magnifying the risk of errors and potentially magnifying risk of fraud. Well, you can automate reconciliation just as you can automate payments, just as you can automate an approval process or a workflow in general, just as you can automate data capture. And so what we want to do now is pose our second of four polling questions. I talked about delays that can result if one does not have a timely process or rather is not timely in making payments or does not have visibility into the status of payments or does not know if invoices have even arrived. These are all risks that can contribute to uh, 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 late payments. And so we wanna find out is what percentage of your company's payments typically incur late fees, which you're welcome to do. Select one of these choices from top to bottom. They are below 5%, between 5% and 10%, between 10% and 25%, 25% or more. If you don't know, that's fine. And then I'm looking forward to continuing our discussion because I'm also looking forward to giving you the opportunity to see automation in action. And in particular, Bill's approach to applying automation to accounts payable processes. We will now continue our discussion. And what we're going to do is consider the role of automation. Granted, this webinar is sponsored by Bill, but automation is the key point here. So, for example, rather than having to type in information from an invoice, there are a number of capabilities. We've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. Let me be more precise. Machine learning, and in particular, applying machine learning, not just optical character recognition, because optical char character recognition itself, which has been around since the 90s, uh, that can help you distinguish, let's say, the number zero from the letter O. But there's more to it than that, because you actually do need to apply some actual machine learning. We're not going to go into the details of machine learning. That's a topic in itself. But the point is that we can apply the latest advances in artificial intelligence and in particular with regard to machine learning, so that it is possible for 
you to automate data capture with regard to invoices. So that's one. The other thing you can do is apply automation to establishing a workflow. Now, the best example and the most relevant example here is an approval workflow. Number one, determining where to route an invoice, who is responsible, how many people, at what level, what order, uh, the order in which uh, an approval happens. That's a process that certainly lends itself to automation. And we're going to talk about that. Indeed, Seth is going to go into some detail about applying automation to establishing a workflow so that there is no guesswork with regard to an approval process. Of course, there's payment. And here's the thing about payment. With regard to payment, you're not limited, let's say, to using paper checks, although that is an option, although we have a secure way to enable you to use, uh, or rather to pay using paper checks. But we have other options. We have ACH, uh, we have credit cards, virtual cards, um, international payments, uh, we have uh, wire, you know, for example, um, and also, as I said, paper checks, but again, a much more secure process than relying on checks that display your own banking information. And then finally, we can automate reconciliation, which is absolutely crucial. This way, depending on the accounting system you're using or the enterprise resource planning system that you're using, we have a way to eliminate data entry so that you can simply bring the information over from bill uh, to your accounting or enterprise resource planning system. We will talk about that as well. Finally, before we transition to our demo, we do want to pose our third polling question, and then we will transition to our demo from Seth. Our third of four polling questions asks whether or not you agree or disagree with the statement that your company relies on manual processing review and approve invoices. This is going to be crucial because we're going to talk about how you can automate processes for reviewing and approving invoices. We do want to find out, though, the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement that your company, once again, the keyword is relies, relies on manual processes to review and approve invoices. The important thing to keep in mind is that it is possible to apply automation to certain processes. And one process, or rather one of multiple processes that lends itself to automation is reviewing invoices and approving invoices. So I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Seth, who will present a demo of Bill AP from beginning to end. And then we look forward to addressing questions in the time that we have remaining thereafter. So. Seth, let me turn it over to you and let, let me give you some time to transition to your demo environment. And I invite attendees to turn the floor over to my colleague, Seth. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, you know, for attending today. Uh, so what I'll be doing today is going over a four step process. Uh, step one. We'll be getting those documents into the inbox so we can start creating those bills. Step two will then be writing up for approvals and I'll be able to go over the different approval policies that you're able to create within bill. Step three will then be writing up for payments and I'll be able to go over the different payment methods that we offer as well as post payment actions. And then the last step would be reconciliation. Okay. But before we jump into the inbox, I do like to go over the first page you'll be viewing as soon as you log into a bill account. This will kind of give you a bird's eye view into the most recent transactions. So from here, we'll be able to keep track of any bills that are overdue or that are due within the next seven days or seven days plus. We'll also be able to give you a quick glance of any upcoming payments that are scheduled to be going out to the vendors, as well as any payments that have been processed in the last 30 days. We will also be providing you a bill approval queue, which will be broken down by approvers. That way you can keep track of how many bills are assigned to those approvers and how many dates it's been since those bills have been approved. And we will be sending out automatic reminders to those approvers if they do have any outstanding bills on their end. Yeah. And we will also be providing you a to-do list. Now the to-do list is designed based on your user permissions. 
since I am an administrator and have full access to this account, I'll be able to see if any bills have been denied, if any bills are ready to be paid, or if there's any documents in the inbox that still haven't been processed. So I'll be able to keep track of my daily bill.com tasks using my to-do list, which I can also have it emailed to me directly. And then one last thing I'd like to cover here right on the home screen is we have a new feature called Bill Balance. The way I like to describe this is think of it kind of like a Venmo account where you're able to preload funds, right? Now, the benefit of using a Bill Balance is one, you can actually get these payments out much sooner, meaning we can actually cut down on the processing time. For example, if we were to process a payment today by four o'clock Pacific time, we can actually get those funds deposited into the vendor's bank account the very next business day. The other benefit of using bill balance is that you're also able to send out large payments without having to, uh, having to go through the additional processing time as well. So, um, you know, great feature for some of those quick payments that we need to send out, but also if they are very large payments that we need to get those to the vendors. Okay. The way you can preload funds to the bill balance is you can either do a wire transfer or you can do a standard bank transfer, which usually takes around three to four business days. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and jump right into the first step, which is the inbox. First things first is we got to get those documents into the inbox so we can start creating those bills. Now, there's a few different ways to accomplish that. The preferred method would be to use the dedicated email address that's assigned to the inbox. So what we can do here is we can provide that to the vendors. Vendors can then just email those documents right in. Um, if you already have an AP email address set up to receive those bills, you could just create a forwarding rule as well. For some of those vendors that are still sending in paper bills, you can scan them, upload them into the inbox. You can use the drag and drop feature. And then for those who are always on the go, never really have a chance to be in front of a computer or access to a scanner, uh, you can also use your mobile device. All you'll need to do is just log into the bill.com app, take a picture of the physical document, which will then upload into the inbox within a matter of seconds. So as you can see, something as simple as a handwritten note would be more than enough to get the bill creation started. When it comes to working with the inbox, it does have unlimited document storage, meaning you don't have to worry about reaching any type of limit, which is another reason why a lot of our clients like to use it as a digital filing cabinet. So not only are you able to upload bills and invoices, you can upload W-9s, contracts, agreements, receipts, you know, any important document that you like to store either at the vendor level, or you can come right in here under documents, click folders, and this is where you can really build out that digital filing cabinet. Right? You can create as many folders as you like. As soon as those documents are in the inbox, you can then start filing those away into one of those digital folders. And then if you ever need to retrieve the document, you can just click on the folder, click on the document. From here, you can view it. You can even download it if you need to, but at least this way you don't have to hold on to any more of those paper copies. Everything can be digitally stored within Bill. Now, as soon as the documents are uploaded into the inbox, our intelligent virtual assistant will then start taking over those documents. And the first thing that it's gonna do, it's gonna look for any potential duplicates by taking the vendor name, the invoice number, and running it against the vendor record in bill. Now, if it does find a potential duplicate, it's gonna first flag it as a duplicate. It's also gonna be providing you a direct link to that existing bill. So from here, you can decide whether you want to delete this document, if you want to attach it to that existing bill, or if you simply just want to file it away into one of those digital folders. So what we're going to do here, we're going to pretend uh, a Sienna design did some work for us. Uh, they went ahead and emailed us their invoice right into our inbox. We're going to click on their invoice. We're going to click enter bill. Now, as soon as we do that, our intelligent virtual assistant will then start taking some of that high level information from the document, and it's going to start plugging that in into the bill creation template. So as you can see, it plugged in the vendor name, invoice number, invoice date, the due date, as well as the total amount of the bill. There's gonna be three other sections that are also gonna be pre-populated for you. However, that information is actually not going to get pulled from the document. We're gonna be using a different technology called Smart Data Entry. And what Smart Data Entry does, it actually goes back to the very last bill that was created for that specific vendor. And it's gonna plug in the same bill description, those same line items, as well as assign those same approvers. So as you can see, as soon as we clicked enter bill, I'd say 97, 98% of the bill has already been pre-populated for you. So it really becomes more of a review process than a data entry process at that point. 
Now, the only time we're going to need to make any manual adjustments here is if we're going to be working with multiple line items. If we're only going to be working with one, our intelligent virtual assistant will actually just take that full dollar amount and it's going to plug it in for you. But if we need to work with multiple line items, we're going to need to break down those dollar amounts ourselves. <clears throat> but the best part of it is we don't even have to type it in. We can use our click to capture tool where all we need to do is come right into the invoice, highlight the dollar amount, click on it once to copy, and then click once again to paste. If we want to add a bill description, we can do exactly the same thing. Just highlight the information you want to add from the invoice, click on it once to copy, and then click once again to paste. So in a matter of a few clicks, we were able to add a bill description. We were able to break down the dollar amounts for each one of our line items. And this bill is ready for the next step, which is writing it for approvals. Now, the following step is writing, a, writing the bill for approvals. We do offer two types of approvals. We do have the approval group as well as the individual approver. The approval group does have an and or functionality. For example, here we created a group that has 15 approvers. As soon as we click save and close, each one of those approvers will receive an email notification letting them know that they've been assigned to a bill that needs to be reviewed and approved. However, only one approver would be required to approve the bill. So whoever gets to it first, reviews it and approves it, we would then be removing it from everyone else's approval queue. And then if there is a second approver on that bill, we will be notifying them it's their turn to review and approve the bill. Within each bill, we also have a notes section. So if there's anything special going on with this bill, we can always leave notes. That way other approvers, administrators, or anyone who has access to review the bill will be able to see those notes. But one of my favorite features here is that you can actually communicate with your team member. For example, I can tag Alan, I can leave Alan a note. As Soon as we click save and close, Alan would then receive an email notification where he would be able to review that note. But then if he wants to reply to it, it's gonna bring them right back into this bill. So going forward, all that communication will be kept within bill. No need to email them, call them, or text them outside of the platform. And any notes that are entered in bill cannot be edited, cannot be deleted, which is great for audit purposes. So down the road, we could always come back and review those notes, which will be date and time stamped as well. Now, let me show you the different ways you can create an approval policy. I'm gonna show you the different criteria that you can use. We're gonna go right over to our settings tab. We're going to go over to approvals, bill approval policies. All right. Now, here's the different criteria that we can use. It could be bill amount, line item amount, department, location, job, class, customer, vendor, and chart of accounts. You know, let's say if we were to select vendor, it doesn't have to be just one vendor. You know, we can say anytime a bill is coded to any of these five vendors, you know, we're going to want Alan to be automatically assigned to those bills so that he can review and approve them. But we can even take it a step further. We can say anytime a bill is coded to any of those five vendors and let's say the bill is $500 or more, we're going to want an extra pair of eyes. So we're going to ask that the finance team gets automatically assigned to those specific bills so that they can review and approve them as well. So you can create as many approval policies as you like. Um, you can assign as many approvers as you want to a bill. All you need to do is just create the approval policy once. And if any of your bills meet that certain criteria, bill will automatically assign the approvers. So that way you don't have to do it manually every time you're reviewing and approving bill or creating bills. All right. Now, when it comes to time uh, to approve bills from the approver's perspective, they would be able to log in directly through bill. Now, the first thing you're going to notice for them, it's going to be a little less bids here. Since their permission is really just to approve, that's really the only tab that they're going to see on their end. Okay. From here, they'll be able to see a list of the bills that they are only assigned to to review and approve. Now, at a very high level, they can pick and choose uh, the bills that they want to approve and then click approve. But let's say maybe we want to dive in a little bit deeper and look at the details of the bill. We can click into the invoice number. From here, the approver will be able to see the attached documents. Uh, they'll be able to see any notes that have been left behind, but even as an approver, they can continue adding notes. You know, they can continue tagging team members. Maybe they have a question regarding the bill amount or maybe one of the line items, right? But if everything looks great from here, they can just simply click approve. 
or let's say maybe one of the expense accounts is incorrect, they can then deny the bill. And then regardless of the reason that they're denying the bill, it is required to leave a note. So the approver must enter in a note. We're actually going to be taking that note. We're going to be saving it in the note section. And it's also going to be reflected within the bill's audit trail. We have an audit trail pretty much for everything within bill. From when a bill is created, from when a payment is created, uh, if a, a chart of account, a vendor, you know, so you'll be able to keep track of, you know, any updates that are made for that specific uh, LIPS object within bill. Right. Now, once the bill has been approved, the next step will then be to create those payments. And uh, there's two different areas where we can review unpaid bills. We can go under the bills and then click unpaid bills tab from here. Now, this is going to give us a list of all bills, whether they're fully approved, partially approved, or not even approved at all. But let's say maybe we only want to pay bills that are fully approved. What we want to do is we want to go under our task tab and we want to click bills that are ready to be paid. By going down this route, it's going to automatically enter, uh, populate the approved filter. So now we'll be able to see only fully app approved bills. So now what we can do is we can just pick and choose which bills we want to pay and then click review and pay. Or hey, it's Wednesday. Maybe we only want to make one payment run. We can select all of our bills at once and then click review and pay. Since we do have our money transmitter licensed in all 50 states, we will be able to process all of your e-payments, also known as ACH payments. Uh, we'll be able to create and mail out those physical checks out to the vendors. Uh, we even send out um, international wires. We can send those in either USD or in the vendor's local currency. And then for some of those vendors that only want to accept credit card payments, we can send them a virtual card, which is a one-time use 16-digit virtual card uh, that they can use to process on their end using their POS system, right? But everything can be done directly through bill without you having to worry about submitting any positive pay forms or any NACHA files to a bank. We do not use a third party to process our payments. All of our payments are processed directly through bill. So if you have any questions regarding those payment details, you can always contact us directly and we will be able to assist. Um, just to kind of go over some of our payment methods here, uh, here's an example of our checks that we're going to be sending out. Right? It'll have the remittance information, top left-hand corner. It'll have the company information, uh, the vendor name. We're also going to be providing a stub along with those check payments so that the vendor knows exactly what they're going to be getting paid for. But then when we do send out these checks, the banking information on these checks will actually be Bill's banking information. So at no point do we ever expose your banking information to the vendors. When it comes to setting up vendors for ACH, we have a few different ways. Uh, the first one is what I kind of refer to as the old school method way where you can just go to the vendor. If they provided you their banking information, you can click on their, on their tab, click on the edit tab here. And then right down here under payment type, you can enter in their routing and bank account information. Now, if you do go down this route for a few of your vendors, I always recommend send them an invite. That way you can start paying them via e-payment, but down the line, if they ever want to change their bank account, they'll be able to manage that on their end. This way they don't have to keep sending you their banking information every time they want it to be updated. Okay. The other options of sending up vendors for e-payments is in the initial sync, you know, if we are working with a, a an accounting software that integrates with Bill um, that has an API sync integration, what we do is we actually pull in your entire list of vendors, okay? But at the end of the day, it really comes down to anytime you create a vendor within Bill, what we're going to do is we're going to see if they already exist in our network. You know, we have close to 5 million payees and payers within our network already. So what we'll do is we'll take the vendor name, the email address, the physical address, and we'll see if we can find a potential match. If we do find one, we'll give you the option to review and connect. So that way, when you connect with your vendor, the payment method will go from a check payment method right into an e-payment method at that very moment. So let's say maybe the vendor doesn't exist in our network. You know, maybe they didn't provide you their banking information. You can always just send them an invite via email. As soon as they receive it, they'll be prompted to enter in their own banking information that they want to use to receive their funds. Uh, they'll have full visibility into all of the payment details. We're also going to be sending them payment notifications, letting them know that they have been paid. And we're going to be providing them the direct deposit date of when those funds will be deposited into their bank account. So we'll definitely keep your ACH vendors up to date. And the best part of it, it's all free. It is a free portal account for the vendors. 
Now we also do send out international wires. Uh, again, we can send those out in the vendor's local currency or we can send those out in USD. Now, if you are working with one of our accounting softwares uh, that does have an API integration with, um, if you have multi-currency disabled, we will still be able to sync those bills and payments over to your accounting software and they will actually convert into USD. Uh, but if you have multi-currency enabled, you know, we will be able to sync those uh, those bills and payments. Now, one other thing I like to bring up while we're creating payments by default, you know, you are able, you would be able to select a bank account that you want to use to fund those payments. And basically the way it works, we would be able to debit the funds from the bank account. And from there, depending on how your vendor is set up, we would then be able to send them a check or we can send them an e-payment, right? Um, however, we do have a new feature that's called pay by card where instead of using a bank account, you can now use a um, you can now use a credit card. It would work pretty much the same way where we would be able to debit the funds from the credit card, but we would still be able to pay your vendor via e-payment or we can still send them a check as well. Okay, so another great way, you know, to continue uh, you know, earning those points, or you know, maybe you just want to pay something with a credit card, you know, you could definitely do it directly through Bill. All right. Now, once the payments have been created, we will be able to provide you a payment confirmation number, which you'll be able to use to review the details. Uh, let me go ahead and click on one here. Regardless if we're going to be sending out checks, e-payments, international wires, virtual credit cards, you know, we are going to be showing you the progress from the time the payment is processed all the way until it's cashed for checks or deposited for the other payment methods. If we are going to be sending out checks on your behalf, since we are going to be using our own check stock, we're going to make sure to provide you a check number, check date, uh, check expiration date. Our checks do remain active for 90 days. On the 91st day, if the check is not cashed, it will auto void. The funds will be returned back to the bank account that was used to fund those payments. And the actual bill will go from a paid status right back to an unpaid status. So you can just create a new payment. You don't have to worry about recreating the bill and having to go through the approval process once again. Uh, but if the checks do get cashed within those 90 days, we're going to be providing you the front and back images of those cashed checks for your records. Okay. So we uploaded the document, we got it coded, we got it approved, we created the payment. The next step is getting this information over to your accounting software. Okay. Now, if the currently the accounting software that we do have an API integration with is QuickBooks Desktop, including Enterprise, uh, QuickBooks Online, Zero, Sage Intact. Oracle NetSuite and Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central. Okay, so with the you know with the click of a button, we are able to actually sync these bills and payments over to your accounting software. And it's not just journal entries. You know, you'll be able to go into your accounting software. You'll be able to click on the bill, view the coding. You can click on the payment and then view the payment details as well. Now, when it comes time to processing those funds and debiting the funds from the bank account or credit card, what we do is we do one lump sum. Okay, So if you were to pay 10 bills at $100 each, when you look at your bank statement, you'll see one transaction for $1,000. Okay? So what we've done is we've created a money out clearing account, and we're going to be creating this in the accounting software as well. Right? And the sole purpose of this account is so that you can actually break down that lump sum. OK, so you'll be able to see the individual payments from when they were first created and scheduled. And then on the process date, we're going to sync over that lump sum, which will then offset those individual payments and balance it out to zero. Okay, so all of this will be done via the sync. No need to do any manual reconciliation for any payments that have been processed directly through bill. All right. Right, and I think that would pretty much conclude my demo. Uh, I think we covered all four steps, you know, getting those documents into the inbox, getting them approved, getting them paid, and then getting this information over to the accounting software. Um, if you are working with an accounting software that, that is not QuickBooks, uh, or QuickBooks Zero, Intact, NetSuite, or Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central, uh, we do have a import-export tool that you're able to use to export you know, all of your bills, all of your payments directly from, from bill as well. Uh, they are, you know, we generate CSV files. So that way, you know, you can, 
you can view them, you can manipulate them. Maybe you have to change it, uh, headers uh, here and there, but you know we will be able to provide you all of those details via CSV. All right, Joe, I'll turn it right back over to you. So you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. And what we are going to do is we are going to address some great questions from attendees. We've received great questions from attendees. Um, and I think certainly one of them has to do with reconciliation. I think question I'm sure, Seth, you've seen many, many times with regard to reconciliation has to do with the extent to which there's an out of the box integration versus a different process. So I, I know attendees, and this is uh, this reflects a uh, number of attendees. Um, I, I would say that a number of attendees have indicated that um, what they want to do is uh, find out how they can uh, establish uh, a automated process for reconciliation. But I do understand that there are different ways to do that, either an out of the box pro approach or perhaps um, a different approach. So just wanted to give you the opportunity step to go through those two different scenarios. So out of the box, I would say kind of like to, I mean, when it comes to working with an ERP system that we don't have an API integration with, one is we do have the import export tool, but we can also work with, um, you know, we wouldn't be the ones developing the API, but we what we can do is pre we can provide an API key where, you know, if you want to build something out on your end, if you have, you know, your IT department, they can build something out on your end. And then what we can do is we can provide the key. So that way you are able to push and pull data directly from Bill. Um, so that's usually kind of the, the um, way that, you know, a lot of our clients who are not working with, you know, a QuickBooks, a Zero, IntexAge, or NetSuite, uh, sometimes they do like to build out their own API integration with us. Thank you, Seth. Another question that Anthony has, um, and this has to do with approval workflows. Let's say there are different entities within a single organization. To what extent can one set up a workflow so that it accounts for different entities within an organization and therefore different individuals within different entities in connection with the workflow for both reviewing and approving invoices. Gotcha. So the approval policy would fall would apply just to the one bill.com account, right? So when you're when you're coding a bill, you can code it to multiple departments. You can code code it to multiple locations. However, when it comes time to reviewing and approving, the approver would be able to see the entire bill. So it's not like you can only, the approver would only be able to see the one line item. They're gonna be re able to review all line items, all coding, all of the documents attached to that bill. And then from there, they can decide whether, yeah, this is correct or you know they wanna deny it as well. But um, it's all based under one bill. All approvers will be able to see the entire bill. Thank you, Seth. Another question from an attendee having to do with payments. And in particular, let's say uh, you have a scenario where, uh, and actually this goes back to the approval process in particular, but uh, let's say you have a scenario where one needs to approve and then you have a scenario where one needs to pay. Can the workflow or the automated workflow that one sets up account for both Review, or, but uh, not only reviewing and approving, but also paying. In other words, can that it can that be part of the workflow? It can designate specific individuals or specific roles for that for, for those tasks. Absolutely. So when you're setting up approvers to a bill, it does it it doesn't just apply to the approval role. It applies to all roles. So you can have an administrator be the last user to review and approve it before they initiate or create and schedule that payment. So yes, you can definitely ha you can definitely uh, implement that into the workflow for sure. That sounds great. Um, and then another question related to that 
let's say the typical approver, whether it's for um, approving a payment or reviewing an invoice, let's say that individual uh, has to be out. Um, in other words, is it possible to set up backup approvers or is it possible to set up any kind of contingencies when one sets up the workforce? Great question. So usually what, what we did, that was one of the reasons why we created the approval group. So that way, you know, you can add multiple approvers into one group. So whoever gets to it first, maybe one of the approvers might be out, but, you know, there's still going to be two other approvers within the group where they can review and approve it as well. Right. Um, but under the approval policies as well, we also have another way where you're able to um, basically replace the approver for that time. So it'll remove that approver from any approval policies that they're a part of, and you can replace them with another approver. And then when they return, you know, back to, back to work, what you could do is you would just have to switch them right back and uh, replace them with their, uh, with their alternative, with their substitute right back in. Thank you very much. So I do want to note a couple of things before we continue with more questions. Uh, first of all, the QR code that you are viewing that QR code enables you to visit a page from which you can request a demo. At some point, you can feel free to do so after our webinar concludes. Also, I want to acknowledge we do have a fourth question, a fourth polling question that is coming up, and we will plan to pose the fourth polling question after Q&A. So just want to give you a heads up there, and we are going to plan to pose our fourth polling question so you have enough time to respond to it. So stay tuned. In the meantime, I want to address some additional questions from attendees. And uh, another question from an attendee uh, is uh, having to do with bill balance. Um, an attendee, when hearing about bill balance, was un or is under the impression that uh, bill balance limits what invoices can be paid. So uh, on behalf of the attendee, I wanted to ask if, if you could clarify uh, bill balance or uh, explain uh, the connection between using bill balance and uh, paying invoices. Yeah, absolutely. So the when it comes to paying bill balance, the, the limit there for, for setting out payments, and this is like all combined, is $10 million, uh, $10 million per, um, you know, per payment, right? It's, it's a $10 million limit. Um, but I believe it's uh, e-payments. You can send out for e-payments. You can send out for check payments. Um, and I believe you can also do international wires. I, may, I might not need to double check on there. I'm not 100%, but I know it's for e-payments and checks uh, 100%. I know I know we can send those out. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah that, that, that would be it. <laughs> Appreciate your uh, confirming that. And of course, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, that any questions we don't have the opportunity to address during this webinar, we'll plan to follow up on after our webinar. We're receiving a lot of great questions. Indeed, another question from an attendee um, has to do with uh, entering information. So is it possible, let's say, let's say one has multiple invoices on one document, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, is there a way for a bill, let's say, to automate the process of entering multiple invoices, let's say, that appear on a single document? Is that something that Bill can do? Or would, the, would you even recommend doing it that way? So you can upload batches into the inbox for sure. Uh, I believe it's up to 25 pages. Um, might be a little bit more, but you can upload uh, batches into Bill, and our intelligent virtual assistant will be able to break down each individual document uh, and you know start creating the bills. First thing it'll do is it'll double, it'll make sure to see if there are any duplicates, right? So if it takes the vendor name, it'll take the invoice number. If it does find a potential duplicate, it'll flag it as a duplicate. Um, but you know, you are able to upload batches, create bills from them. You can separate all the pages so you can create individual bills as well. Um, so, yep, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely I, I would definitely recommend maybe uploading them batches. That way you don't have to do it one by one. Um, and then you can just create bills from them as well. But our system will start breaking them down for you. And we'll assist That's with that. That's great. That's great. Very <laughs> helpful. Very helpful. Um, and then another uh, consideration with regard to that 
And that's the inbox itself. An attendee is asking, number one, what could go in the inbox? Number two, to what extent can Bill use information from non-invoice documents like W9, for example? And I recognize that, um, you know, we, we are talking about present capabilities. We're not talking about anything in the future. Just want to be clear about that. So two part question. One, what type of documents can go in the inbox, the bill inbox? And number two, to what extent can bill uh, automate the uh, usage, if you will, of any documents that are not necessarily invoices, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So the, the formats that we support with our inbox would be uh, PDFs, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, text, PNG, JPEG, and GIF. Uh, so those are the different formats. Uh, when they do, when they are uploaded into the inbox, we don't convert them into, P, uh, you know, PDFs. They'll remain as an image. Uh, so when it comes time to review and approve them, or if we just need to, you know, if they're being stored within Bill to review them, it's going to be in their original format, right? Um, you can upload any types of documents. Again, uh, if it's like a W9, we actually have a new feature where you can actually drag and drop that W9 right into the vendor's detail page, where it will actually, just the same way as our intelligent virtual assistant, where, where it takes data from the bill, what we'll do is we'll take data from the W9 and start populating it for the vendor's details. So if they're flagged as a 1099 vendor, um, you can just import that W9. And then the other thing it'll do is it'll also let you know that there's a W9 on file. Um, so that way you can always review it you know, right before you make payments. Excellent. Thank you, Seth. Another question. Um, uh, let's say one is working with third party system, it could be uh, enterprise resource planning system or an accounting system. What is the source of truth? In other words, if we're talking about a payment in particular or an invoice in particular, where does one go for the source of truth? Does that question make sense? In terms of, let's say, okay, and I'll clarify further, this is on behalf of the attendee. Let's say we're talking about the status of an invoice or the status of a payment. Um, which is the source of truth, bill or the enterprise resource planning system or accounting system? So I would go with bill because one, remember we're creating the payments directly from bill. So if the payment, you know, if the payment has already been created for that specific bill, the status of the bill will go from an unpaid status to a paid status. Um, so I would say the source of truth would be bill because what if you haven't initiated ASIC? Maybe you haven't done an export at that moment, right? Um, so we don't know if the, the, the most likely that the payment doesn't exist in the ERP, in the accounting uh, service, right? So. I would always say bill because that is where the payment is being initiated and that'll give you real live data and you can actually see the details of that payment as well as soon as you create it. That's really helpful. One question an, an attendee had. Um, so number one, uh, two part question. Uh, and that the first part of the question is what roles are available when setting up workflow is kind of analogous to the out of the box question about uh, reconciliation. So with regard to setting up workflows, what are standard roles? Number one, number two, is it possible to create custom roles with regard to workflow? Absolutely. Uh, so right off, right out of the box, we have accountant, uh, administrator, approver. Uh, we have a clerk, we have a payer, and we also have an auditor role. Uh, so you can select those directly, you know, when you're creating your users. However, uh, absolutely, you can create custom roles where you can literally pick and choose which permissions you wanna provide that, that role. So when you create the user, you can then just simply assign that role to that user. Um, if, you, if you need to, you can always go back and update the permissions for that specific role. So don't feel like you need to delete it and restart a whole new role. Uh, but yes, um, you can definitely create custom roles within Bill. Great, and, and uh, related to that as well, you mentioned audit. Um, many attendees have this question, and I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Audit trail, is that something that Bill automates? In other words, establishing and maintaining an audit trail? Absolutely, yes. 
And, and like I said, it's pretty much for everything. From the time you create a user, uh, from the time you create a bill, when you pay it, if you update it, it'll provide you the user who made that change. It'll provide you a date and time stamped as well. And it's also going to show you what update was made for that specific transaction. I think we have time for maybe one more question and uh, just a quick one and then we'll pose our first po polling question and then we'll conclude. Um, quick question having to do with working with Bill, let's say, to set up a um, custom um, integration, let's say, with a third party system. Um, now, what... Uh, what is the overarching process? We don't have to go into too much detail, but you know, what is typically the process there? Yeah. So what you would be able to do is we, you know, you can, we, we, we have a development team that you can work with. Uh, the way it would begin is we would first hear the case, you know, why would you want to, you know, why are you wanting to use the, or, you know, the dev key? Uh, second thing is we would be able to set you up with a sandbox. So that way you can test, you know, pulling in and uh, pulling data, you know, pulling, uh, pushing data. Uh, and if everything, you know, seems like, okay, this is going to work perfectly from there, we can actually switch you over to a production account um, and then just kind of have you go from there. So there are a few steps, but at, at the same time, you know, we want to know what the case is to make sure that it, it is a good fit. And then, you know, if we can see that it is something that we're, we're able to assist with from there, we can just have you uh, jump on a sandbox so you can test it out yourself. Um, if, and then from there, if everything's great, we move you over to production. Excellent, excellent. Well, I do want to acknowledge we have received great questions from attendees. We'll plan to follow up on any questions from attendees we have not had the opportunity to answer during this webinar. What we would now like to do is pose our fourth polling question. This is the fourth of four, and then I'll turn it over to Jason to conclude. First of all, as we pose this polling question, I do want to thank you, Seth, for sharing your expertise for the demo and uh, not only for uh, conducting the demo, but also answering questions from attendees. This is our fourth polling question for attendees. And the question is, when does your company intend to automate its AP process from top to bottom? The choices are we already have. Within one to three months, four to six months, six months or more, we probably won't. We, we do want to give attendees sufficient time to respond to our fourth of four polling questions. And then what we will do is turn the floor over to to conclude to convey some closing remarks. But again, do want to thank you attendees for joining us. Of course, Seth, appreciate your sharing uh, your expertise and we uh, look forward to the opportunity to talk about AP during future webinars and especially best practices for managing AP and best practices for applying automation in AP. Thank you again for such an incredible session. I also want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Our next session will begin at 1235 Eastern, which will be a keynote titled SMB Growth Despite Disruption. Please click on the join button that will appear on your screen to be redirected, and we look forward to seeing you there.